And also, good afternoon to all of you. Today, I'm really pleased to announce that under the aegis of National Agricultural Higher Education Project and the Institutional Development Plan at Rajmata Vijayaraja Sindhya, Krishi Vishwadhyale Gwalior, which is sponsored from ICR and World Bank. Today, we are organizing an invited talk on Internet of Things and Artificial Intelligence Application in Agriculture. I, uh, I welcome here our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor S. K. Rao, our special guest of today's talk, Dr. Mukti Sathan Basu, an ex director of Directorate Groundnut Research, Junagadh, Gujarat, and currently, sir, is an MD of uh, SBSF Consultancy Group. And the excellent and brilliant speakers, are of, uh, speakers of our today's talk, Dr. Shravani Basu and Dr. Sebastian Fukat. I welcome you all. With this, I extend my heartly welcome to all the participants who are witnessing our today's program. As uh, there are two terms, two words we have used, IoT and AI. These are very hot words in these days. As we all know, that in the current situations, we are facing the health as well as economic crisis, as well as a very big sector that is agriculture, which is day by day deteriorating and posing a chronic food crisis. The current shift in the climatic patterns, the instability in trade and geopolitics, the alarming population of our nation, as well as the widening economic gap is putting the livelihood of millions at the risk globally, as well as in our nation. The major issues like poverty, malnutrition, starvation, the stagnant crop yields, the deteriorating soil fertility, as well as the quality of food has become an everyday reality in everybody's talk. So although we are uh, doing mechanization and by our intensive agriculture practices, we are increasing the number of food grains on our account day by day and year to year. But there is a big challenge to aggregate this large data as well as to identify the right data at the right time it's really a breathtaking task. So the today's topic is to discuss the data can feed the world, but do we have the right data? And we have to pause here just to move ahead. So with this background, today we are really fortunate to uh, learn our brilliant speakers having a vast knowledge in the data analysis as well as having a good exposure in the agriculture field so I welcome to our uh, speakers for our today's invited talk on Internet of Things and Artificial, artificial Intelligence Application in Agriculture. But uh, before handling this platform to our speakers, I will uh, take this chance to introduce them for uh, everybody's interest. So firstly, I will introduce Dr. Sebastian Fokat. Sir, you're most welcome. And Sir is uh, working right now as a senior executive in data and technology. He is a transformational leader, having a strategic vision, and he is having a excellence in the asset maximization as well in operation of these data statistically. Sir has done his PhD in astrophysics from the university. Um, I can't pronounce that, but it, it is in France. And Sir has done his master's in astronomy and astrophysics, as well as he has done his BSc in physics from France. Along this, Sir is having a vast experience in the field, practical field, and in the in the uh, and we can say in the field of teaching also. Sir has worked as research fellow and a very known Marie Curie postdoctoral fellow in uh, Italy as well as he has worked as assistant professor for uh, three or four years in the National Taiwan Normal University in Taipei, Taiwan. He has also worked as associate professor uh, in Shanghai Jiaotong University in Shanghai, China. In spite of this academic record, Sir is having a good exposure in R&D field. He has specialization in observational cosmology research and data management. He has published 120 plus high NAS rated, high impact factor 
uh, peer reviewed publications as well as he has delivered 30 plus invited talks in number of international conferences along with this he has chaired number of posts as a head of data science and data engineering he has been uh, appointed as a global head of data innovations had been head of data sciences he has been a managing director director as well as member of number of advisory boards in number of firms across the globe in number of countries he has done work and at the same time i take this opportunity also to introduce his uh, co-partner dr shravani basu and i am really pleased that madam has done madam did her bsc uh, msc in horticulture and plant breeding and genetics from gujarat agriculture university junagadh india she has uh, she did a phd in plant molecular genetics and biotechnology from university of nottingham uh, uk and in between ma'am has also done mba from nottingham university business school uk along with this bright uh, bright academics ma'am is having a sound knowledge in uh, research and development as well as in marketing and data and di digitalization in the field of market or in uh, formulation of models and everything she is having more than 10 years work experience as an independent business and uh, strategic consultant madam has also been in touch of number of firms related to agriculture field and other data analysis field in various countries like in germany china taiwan india so i hope uh, are both the speakers having a uh, having years of practical field experience as well as they are related to agriculture field also so without wasting time without wasting uh, everybody's time i invite dr shavani basu and dr sebastian pokats to deliver uh, their uh, talk on iot and ai application in agriculture so we all are waiting here to harness your practical experience and we gain something from that and i request all all the participants to please pose their queries or questions in the chat box that will be answered by our speakers at the end of the presentation so now i am lending this uh, platform to our speakers dr shamya and dr sebastian you are most welcome sir okay yeah yeah all right can you see us now Can you see the slide? Yes, it's visible. Okay. Yeah, visible, audible, both. Yeah, okay. both, both. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Dr. Ekta Joshi, for this very warm introduction. I don't know how much we deserve, but uh, we are very happy to get this opportunity to uh, share whatever we know about um, agriculture uh, and digitalization and technology in the field of agriculture. So. also i would like to take this opportunity to thank dr akhilesh singh who first contacted us about the talk so thank you akhilesh and thank you ekta again um we jumped on the opportunity because of course we are very passionate about agriculture like all of you and what we realized is there is no time to be lost anymore we have to do everything we can collectively and as individuals to bring agriculture back into spotlight this has been one of the most ancient of human enterprises and yet we can say that this has also been one of the most neglected enterprise ever since um you know humanity existed and the only way we can bring about fundamental changes in agriculture is by 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 bringing technology and that is the latest technology in the field of agriculture and this will help us put the spotlight back on a field not as agriculture as a poor man's occupation but agriculture as a field of technology and um you know something which is able to deliver cutting edge cutting edge products and services so there is no denying that a lot of companies these days are being powered by data look at e-commerce look at um, all the internet internet based companies everyone is exploiting data and um there is no denial that technology is enabling us to collect more and more data every day but the question comes is do we have enough data and if we have enough data do we have the right data because this is the only way by having the right data we can develop products and services that will really go on to feed the world so yes data can feed the world but the question the big question is do we have the right data and in this um framework 
of today's topic, we will discuss data, artificial intelligence, um, and how Internet of Things is, is helping us acquire more and more data for the service of agriculture. The outline of our talk um, is based on a couple of themes. But before we go to that, I would like to just say what SPSF stands for. SPSF stands for Science, Business, and Sustainable Futures. So this was um, something we, um, no, please go back. So we would like to talk about all the new challenges in agriculture, how data can support agriculture, what is artificial intelligence? I'm sure you all have a very good idea of what artificial intelligence is, but how data, machine learning, can lead to artificial intelligence in agriculture. This is the what we are going to focus on today. And why data collection is the pain point, because this is um, the biggest challenge, not the technology itself, but collecting the right data and using and deploying the right data is the challenge. And we will also go on to talk about careers in digital farming and precision agriculture, because these, like, th this is the career of the future. And, and I think all of us, we are at the moment in the right field at the right point in time. Never before have, has it been so good for us to be agriculturists. So we will talk about this so that young undergraduates, postgraduates, and uh, even PhD students can start thinking how they can build their careers use uh, by deploying technology to the domain knowledge that they're already acquiring at the university. Just to introduce ourselves quickly, and uh, I think um, I wouldn't go too much into details because Dr. Joshi has already done a very good job at that. So I'm a partner at SBSF Consultancy. I consult in the field of agriculture and also pharmaceuticals um, across, um, and I have worked across many different countries. Dr. Sebastian Foucault, he is currently the Chief Data Officer at HRS Group, which is a technology platform uh, company, and it caters to the Fortune 100 companies across the world. He specializes in data science and data strategy, and also um, how data is used for developing machine learning algorithms leading to the development of uh, artificial intelligence. He also has expertise in product and software development. So um, we'll speak about uh, this topic then. And as I said, SBSF stands for Science, Business, and Sustainable Futures. So we conceived this com company, uh, the idea of something like this, a consultancy based on um, science business, which can bring about sustainable futures. We conceived the idea in Germany and India, and then Dr. Basu um, registered the company in Kolkata in India in 2018. And since then, we have been building a huge network, but a very selected network of agricultural experts who, uh, uh, who have ex long expertise in domain knowledge and also um, in different fields of data. Of course, we are here today because we all have a shared passion for agriculture. Through SPSF Consultancy, what we do is we support all aspects of agriculture, right from agricultural production across various production systems and crops, and also in conventional and organic agriculture. And this is where the domain knowledge of Dr. Basu um, comes into full play. He has um, had a very illustrious career for 40 plus years in, at the Indian Council of Agricultural Research and then moved on to work with various international agencies um, like the UN and um, also CGIER systems like ICRASAT and has also worked with private sector companies um, since retiring from the ICAR system. So we wanted to use this knowledge and, um, and also the knowledge of his colleagues who are within this network and um, bring it to the service of agriculture. So what we do at SV SVSF, we are also engaged in crop monitoring, evaluation, quality management, and implementation of organic adoption and certification systems. Um, we also help assist in agricultural business and market development. We also um, have significant knowledge in agricultural financing, the various mechanisms, um, uh, credit scoring for agriculture, and um, we have experts who have worked in fintechs that are related to agriculture. We also advise on food policy regulations and compliance across the world, and these are mostly um, the compliance systems laid down by USDA and um, the European uh, 
Union. So we have uh, a very thorough and fair amount of knowledge in global global compliance systems, apart from the systems that exist in India. And we work in multiple markets across the world. And we use, as far as we can, wherever data is available, a very data-driven approach. So um, this is what we do in, uh, in brief. Also, needless to say, that if you're, uh, if you're going to consult in a data space, you have to have a very good understanding of the value of data. Um, every company we have seen so far across different sectors and different domains have benefited from the access to vast amounts of data. But for agriculture, so far, data is, um, the good thing is data is still not proprietary and a large amount of data is still publicly available through FAO or through um, publications that are available worldwide and through databases that are made uh, freely available by various governments and agencies across the world. So we have this benefit, but it also, uh, and there is an opportunity also to deploy new technology like Internet of Things um, to collect more data that are um, more uh, specific to the problems we are trying to solve. And that brings value from the business perspective. At SVSF, we support companies worldwide, particularly in the agricultural sector. And we help them develop business strategy and planning. And we help them uh, do project-based development of products and services that are driven by artificial intelligence, um, which is basically powered by machine learning and data engineering. So Sebastian will go on to talk more about this and into details that will make it all very clear. We help uh, our clients um, with the best scientific and business expertise in agriculture, biotech, and food and data science and artificial intelligence. And basically what we decided to do when we set up uh, SBS of Consultancy is we realized that you know none of us have all the expertise that we need to, um, to kind of bring the fundamental change that is required in agriculture. It has to be a team effort. It has to be... Um, a lot of people working together and at the same time bringing different expertise and, di and diverse experience towards a common goal. And that's why we decided to create a network where we could harness the experience and um, the, the inherent knowledge that is there, both in India and abroad in the field of agriculture, and extend this network to our clients, which will allow them to kind of uh, harvest the benefit of this combined experience of everyone. So here are the, we are the two partners at SPS of Consultancy. Dr. Mukti Sadhan Basu, who is also joining us. He is the managing director. And as I said, he has 40 plus years of experience in agricultural research and crop production systems. And he has, uh, since retirement, he has also worked across um, many international organizations and uh, private sector companies. So he has a very good global overview of Indian and international agriculture, which we are trying to, um, you know, use and abuse, if I may say. And uh, thank you, Dr. Basu, for joining. And you already know. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah. So, and here are our network of professionals. So we have a very dynamic team. We have experience and wisdom of very experienced people, and we have the raw energy and the raw desire to change of very young people. So um, most of the young faces that you see on this slide from across the world, they are in data science and uh, data engineering. And all the gray haired people that you see are the very experienced people who have immense domain knowledge in agriculture in India and abroad. And uh, they are our experts uh, in this field. So um, as Dr. Joshi has already mentioned, that there are a lot of challenges facing agriculture. Some of them are old, have, are, have been there for time immemorial, and some of them are new challenges. But what the new challenges have evolved, what, I, what we can say from what we see is the new challenges have evolved so fast that people have now started really taking agriculture seriously, and the old challenges have started has suddenly started maturing. 
This is because food security is going to put millions at the risk of starvation. It has already done so. If you look across the Middle East, if you look at Yemen, if you look at uh, Syria, all these war torn countries, where in addition, Egypt in, and even uh, parts of Asia, in addition to um, geopolitical instability, there is also the effects of climate change that they are increasingly witnessing. And millions of people are at the risk of starvation in these countries. While while uh, people are at the risk of starvation, farmers also face existential risk because uh, they are growing crops with no certainty that they will be able to harvest any, um, any produce. So this puts their very livelihood and their very existence as, as, as a threat. And this is why we have seen the increasing number of suicides committed by farmers, um, not only in India, but also in other developing countries. <laughs> Sorry, working from home is never easy. We have people, uh, we have some kids in the background, which are our own. Um, so, so all challenges, and all challenges, if you look at it, we have subsistence farming with little or no crop rotation. And th there is, this is because land holdings are very fragmented. If you look at the land, average size of land holdings in India and in Asia, it's less than one acre which is very difficult to mechanize. Also, different farmers with um, different size of holdings grow different kinds of crops. Also, most of these crops is used for subsistence rather than for commercial, um, commercial purposes. The lack of post-harvest storage and facilities compounds this problem. High input use, we already know, has deteriorated the soil which, and made some soil completely unusable. I mean, these are problems I don't need to talk about to you because you are experts in this field and you have already seen all of this. And to top it all up, to try to make use of the land we have and the crops we are trying to grow and to maximize the ease, what we have done is use more and more inputs, which is ballooning the cultivation costs and creating extreme price volatility. Because at the end, cultivation cost is yours, but what the market pays for the produce is decided by the market. So there is a complete disconnect. More cultivation costs doesn't mean more market price. And this is where the system is failing us, the existing system. And to top it up, there is predatory financing. We all know that in India um, or in anywhere in the world, getting a loan from the banking system is extremely tough. So people often fall prey to uh, financiers who are outside the system charging huge interest rates. And this is not only in India, this is also happening in, um, in countries like Germany. And recently the German government cracked down on such predatory lending who were giving uh, payday loans kind of things at 200%, 300% interest rates. So it's, it's not a problem just chronic to India, but it's a problem that exists across the world. And this is these are the challenges that you know is threatening uh, agriculture more and more and the new challenges what has come to the fore is shifting climate pattern where there is flood or extreme water scarcity and this is happening all at the same time across different regions of the world then if you take the trade and geopolitical instability this is um, completely this is um, reversing globalism. And in a way, countries are becoming more and more uh, nationalistic. But having relied on globalism for so long, to suddenly shift gears is causing a huge challenge as well. And um, the instability across many of these regions is severely threatening several supply chains. Also, the trade barriers and embargoes imposed by many developed countries to protect their interests is harming many countries across the world and at the end it benefits no one we know that new new and known pests and disease outbreaks are there if you take a talk about fall army worm this is a pest which is completely alien to which was completely alien to india it's a pest which escaped from south america and suddenly is a menace across the world and it's devastating crops across asia if you look at uh, some of the other disease, uh, some of the other pests are locusts. It used to be a big problem in Africa, but now we see it 
um, see a huge threat of locusts in India as well. And um, there are diseases like xylella, which, which destroys olive trees, but the, this uh, disease is so slow in its onset that it takes years before you realize that there is no known uh, way of uh, treating the plant and the plant is dead. Uh, hectares of, health, uh, of olive plantation is dying out. There are also, of course, the known pests include all kinds of um, rusts, moths, you name it, it's all there. Um, and um, what is also happening with um, the reason also the pest outbreaks and disease outbreaks are becoming more and more of a challenge is because we are killing biodiversity by intensive mechanization and using chemistry backed solutions, which is kind of backfiring because the biodiversity is lost. The biodiversity is lost and, um, and the environment is, is severely being dis damaged. Um, and we are using so much chemistry-based solutions that it is leading to the uh, buildup of resistance and the irre irreversible changes to the soil profile. So it is high time that we kind of, um, you know, think about agriculture in a more holistic way rather than trying to address uh, bits and pieces where things are falling apart. Data is the key for the future of agriculture. And digital agriculture precision farming, powered by advanced analytics and data science, it seems to hold great promise in building sustainable systems and reduced, uh, reduce the environmental impact of all of these. And here I hand it over to Dr. Sebastian Popo, and he will take you through some of the use cases and uh, other things. All right, thank you very much for, for this interesting introduction. And uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, it's my pleasure just to, uh, to to keep talking about the topic that I really, really have at heart here, also coming from uh, uh, physics and astrophysics and e-commerce mostly. Uh, in, in the past few years, I've been engaging more and more into how we can use data to support agriculture. And here I would just like to showcase uh, a few selected uh, use cases that we have been tackling uh, with uh, SBSF consultancy, whereby we're using actually uh, data and, and machine learning to uh, solve cases uh, that have practical uh, uh, solutions for, for agriculture, and in particular in India. So uh, I would start with uh, one of our most recent uh, uh, study. So this is, ba uh, this is a study uh, uh, based on uh, the effect or the impact of four armyworms, uh, particularly in Africa for that particular study. But as uh, Shravani just uh, said a few minutes before, this is a, a threat that is extending now massively into India. Uh, the problem with four armyworms per, per such is that this pest is having a, a independent, independent life cycle with the crop it feeds on. And that makes it a very uh, challenging for uh, being able to forecast and predict how this pest is going to expand. For sure, it is expanding, and we see now a multiplication of cases in all across India, uh, as much as uh, as well as Africa. So what we did for this particular uh, problem is that we used uh, available, publicly available data from the FAO uh, that is, uh, uh, that's been monitoring the outbreak of uh, fall army worms across the world for the past uh, uh, 20, 15, 20 years. Uh, we combine this information with information on soil, the quality of soil, and as well as forecasting uh, weather data. Uh, all that to have a basically a holistic view and picture of uh, the expansion of this uh, particular pest. As I said, we need to be able also to monitor how the crops are developing in parallel of the pest. Um, we, uh, we used all this uh, information to essentially uh, predict potential outbreaks of, of the fall of mealworms. Um, there are in the data set that we use uh, several methods of inspections of the field uh, or scouting directly or using uh, pheromone traps that are actually IoT uh, triggered and uh, this is uh, what has been used by the, the FAO in Africa for the FAMUS uh, data set. 
Uh, we are uh, focusing on the scouting uh, part because what is very important when you deal with data is to make sure that you have a consistent picture. So making sure that you clean the information and focus only on the uh, on the data set, on the part of your data that really relay uh, information for the forecast. For instance, in that case, we just decided to remove the pheromone information, uh, pheromone traps information. Uh, we use a, a technology that is now uh, more or less out of the box, but that is proved across the years to be extremely efficient called extreme gradient boosting. Uh, it's a case of machine learning. I'll come back on, on, on that later. And uh, basically, we optimize these algorithms to predict uh, uh, what is the, potent, uh, the percentage of plants that are going to be uh, infested by four in the future at a given inspection point. What we have through this study uh, uh, realized is that we could identify uh, important features, so important, uh, 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 let's say, inputs that uh, in data that uh, allows us to uh, uh, predict the spread of fog. Uh, among of all of them would be uh, the, sp the speed of wind, for instance, because the, the, it helps, for instance, the, um, the pest to spread. Uh, the the, the, the full amino is actually a, a moth and that lays worms that are eating uh, the crops. So the, the wind is uh, supporting basically the extension or the migration of the moth, for instance, of the, of the butterfly. Uh, on the other hand, for instance, very strong wind will shake the leaf of the crop and prevent the uh, larva to stay on the crops and then actually uh, um, uh, ex uh, prevent the extension of the pest. So there are lots of, of effect that combination here. So we identified those uh, those 14 features, and now we will be able to uh, move forward and start being able to put in place uh, surveys in India. So we have uh, preparations of, of, um, of projects on, ongoing right now, where we will be able to extend this analysis with the support of the Indian system to build up uh, an alerting system that will be able to inform real time the risks of farmers to be infested by the fall army wars, which is a project that we're working on. So I just, as I said, this is just the, on the left-hand side, you see a picture of the, of the life cycle of this particular, uh, uh, this particular pest. So it started with a moth that's migrating uh, around the field. This pest is very, uh, very uh, it's eating uh, uh, mostly on, on maize, but it's also um, uh, spreading across other crops. Um, the moth is laying uh, eggs under the leaves. The leaves develop in larvas and the larva actually eat uh, the, the crop, and this can happen really overnight. So we can see uh, acres of, of, uh, of crops decimated overnight through this, um, through this pest. And when the larva is mature enough, it falls on the floor and develops as a pupae that then uh, uh, it closes as a moth again and, and the cycle restarts. Um, the middle, you see the effect of that pest, for instance, of plants. And on the right hand side, this is the model that we develop with all the different uh, factors. So this is a basically a decision tree that is coming out of algorithms that basically lay out the different conditions for us to increase uh, the probability of uh, detection of the pest. So in this tree, when you see blue, that means that we have low risk in this with all those conditions uh, gathered together, low risk of infestation. When it's red, there has high risk of, of, of infestations. Uh, we published uh, an article on this that you can see the link on it. It's an uh, open source article that's uh, avail publicly available. Another example is the uh, um, land scouting for uh, crop growing regions. So essentially, the idea of this project was uh, how we can mix information on soil and climate with the plant passport mapping of the, uh, of the crops to identify su su suitable alternate agroecosystem. So let, let's imagine that you grow a particular, you're interested in a particular crop and, and, and it grows only in a very particular set of, uh, of combination of soil and weather. Where in the world such a crop could be uh, grown uh, equivalently? <clears throat> so the, the, the goal here was to uh, really uh, holistically looking at the supply chain to identify the different product categories and geographies to represent the greatest opportunity for developing uh, new capacities. Um, the idea for, for this type of project is to identify new production sites, for instance, less sensitive to uh, shift ecological systems. Um, you can imagine that now with a with shift of patterns in, uh, in, um, in cl with climate change, the conditions
risk, crops that we have applications, for instance, in the pharmaceutical industry or in food. Uh, and so to make sure that we can safeguard this type of, of, uh, of, uh, of crops or this uh, particular uh, breed of crops, then it's very important to be able to identify other uh, sites where we can grow it. Uh, so what we did is that we mined uh, basically again soil and, and weather data, uh, so soil climatic and, and, and crop data to able to able to automatically for a given crop identify other sites. Um, we use for that uh, different machine learning techniques, supervised and unsupervised, um, and that uh, help us to uh, basically cluster information together. So we could basically, in a, in a, in a snapshot of this product, identify ex extremely similar. <laughs> um, so this is how the, the model uh, works in, in, in practice. So we, in one hand, we can also, we have climate data and land data and soil geography that can help us on scouting. And we could combine that with, uh, for instance, yield information and uh, uh, manage crop management uh, information to make some uh, predictions on the yield as well. And on, on the right hand side, you can see maps that have been generated of data. So for instance, in India, the map of average temperature or the uh, precipitation maps that have been combined and used for this particular project. Um, and for instance, if you look for a very specific characteristic of for a given region, let's say that you want a soil for a given pH, an average uh, yearly temperature in the given range, and some uh, amount of precipitation, combining all that together allows you to identify those different regions here. So here we have in gray the pH map, in uh, uh, light blue the temperature map, and in green the precipitation map, and the, where we have the overlap, with these uh, regions very, very similar characteristics. The last uh, uh, project uh, uh, I want briefly to talk about is yield prediction and input-output optimization. So um, to be able to uh, predict actually uh, crop uh, yield is uh, very, very challenging because there are so many complex factors to put in, in, in together. Uh, but it's also a very important for our global food production. So to be able to, to use that, to do that, we need to combine really, really uh, uh, heterogeneous and holistic uh, data sets together. Um, so in, in the case of this project, we have been uh, uh, emerging information about crop genotype, yield performances, obviously, and, and environment, again, weather and soil. Um, we even included in genotype gen genetic informations and uh, the yield performance data set, and I'll come back to that on, uh, in, uh, a bit later when we talk about label data, is uh, observe the yield, check yield, and yield different samples. So we really need to have uh, uh, people with the right expertise here to tell us which data to use uh, and, and to validate the quality of the data before we can feed it in those very complex algorithms. Technically speaking, we use uh, deep learning which is one of the most uh, promising uh, technology uh, that is supporting AI uh, currently. Uh, and, and we use so neural networks to be able to use this uh, very, very extensive data set to predict yields. Just to show you briefly the, the, the result here. So on the left hand side, this is the, the, uh, the basic the algorithms that we use that is called a deep neural network. Uh, and right hand side, you see the results of, of, the, of the project. So on the top, you have what we call the ground truth, so what has been uh, in, in the distribution of yield that has been uh, that has been produced in reality, and uh, on the bottom end you see the the, the predictions that we are uh, that we managed to uh, build up with this model, and you see the overlap between uh, reality and predictions are, are very good in that case. So, what is artificial intelligence, and how does that work? Well, first, uh, intelligence, artificial intelligence is a big, big buzzword today. You can see it everywhere, hear about it. So you have it in your phone at home uh, with uh, uh, Amazon or Siri in your phone. Uh, now we are making extremely uh, fast progresses in self-driving for trucks or for cars. But it's also uh, everything that is around internet or uh, internet of things at home. So from the tip of your fingers on your phone, you can uh, switch off or on uh, your washing machine or, or your blinds. Um, 
it also has been making great uh, progress in healthcare, and we see recently with the uh, with the uh, with the uh, impact of the COVID nineteen, the development that is coming through through uh, the ability to to mine data uh, to make uh, science and healthcare progress faster. Uh, but it's also, for instance, optimizing uh, our grid uh, power management. It's using the US ex uh, extensively to uh, basically distribute evenly, based on machine learning or artificial intelligence, distribute evenly the, the load of electricity on the grid and basically save uh, a lot of money. Um, so we really have entered the edge of data. This is not new. And there's essentially three things that we do uh, with data in general. So there's what we call descriptive analytics which is also called reporting, essentially look at historical data and try to understand uh, what has happened. We have what we call predictive analytics and forecasting, which has uh, been um, massively used in the, in the past 20 years in, in finance, for instance. And, and the idea is really to predict what will happen. And now we're entering in a new area where we have basically prescriptive analytics. It's not only we can predict what uh, will happen, but you can also uh, uh, provide the uh, factors that will influence. And also having machine automatically take decisions to influence basically uh, the future, um, which is essentially what artificial intelligence is about. So wh why, why now and why it's progressing so fast? So there are two things. There are first, uh, our ability now to increase computing power. We have faster computers, we have the cloud, we can massively ingest a very large quantity of data. It's the, the big data problem. Uh, but essentially, the technology that we use on the background in algorithmic is, is, is rather old. We are talking about technology that's been developed uh, 50 years ago, essentially. Uh, and there are two things that uh, computers are very good at, uh, better than us. The first one is rec recognizing patterns. Here I have an example on the left hand side. When you see all those faces, it is how basically how face recognition works. So essentially, the computer is identifying patterns in, in the faces that are common to be able to process uh, 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 the, um, the information very rapidly. So it's all about uh, recognizing patterns uh, very efficiently. The other thing that computers are very good at is optimi optimization. So here it's an example in uh, in um, in, uh, in design actually. Uh, so we have on the left hand side a piece, a big piece of metal that is used to lift cargoes be shifted on, 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 on boats. So this piece is rotating and a cable is, is basically uh, um, um, uh, going around it to leave the cargoes. This is a piece that can sustain very, very large weight. And uh, this company has been uh, basically optimizing uh, the use of metal to uh, fit the exact same purpose, but with far less metal. Uh, so that's what we have in the middle. And so this optimization by a computer and, and between the first and the second piece, you have basically 30% uh, uh, of material that is 70% uh, less material used to build up the piece. And it can satisfy the exact same function. Uh, and in that case, they even went one step further. Here you can still recognize the holes where the cable can go, but they've been uh, one step further and just let the computer go without any constraint to build a new piece that will satisfy uh, uh, physically the, uh, the, 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 same, the same constraints. It's what we get on the right hand side, this very alien-like uh, look uh, piece of metal, which is composed of only 30% of the original weight. And uh, according to uh, the, the, those, um, those designers, this uh, fulfills the exact same uh, function than the first piece. So the computers are really good at, at this type of things. So just to dig into the different buzzwords, so artificial intelligence is a really a, a valleys uh, uh, a word that is used uh, that is used for for many different things. But essentially, this is um, a set of algorithms that can mimic intelligence of human to resolve problem that you can consider smart. We're still very much scratching the the, the surface of, of that yet. The main part of of, uh, of artificial intelligence algorithms are actually quite simple and, and, and used uh, very simply. But it starts with uh, this. In there, you have lots of, of, of intelligence. And even, uh, let's say, a calculator itself is far faster than any of us to, to make calculations. It's already a first level of artificial intelligence. So it's a very, very global uh, term. Practically speaking, what we have is uh, we use machine learning which is, uh, uh, technically speaking, the, uh, the, the build-up that we uh, do today in, uh, in, in any field of, of research. So machine learning is the algorithm that pass data and learn from it. Machine learning. 
So essentially is to use uh, this power of, of uh, pattern recognition as I mentioned before. This is the vastest application of artificial intelligence today. So machine learning is essentially taken algorithms that learn from examples and be able basically to reproduce these examples at, at scale. Um, here uh, we need to uh, first clean the data, we get the data, we get the algorithms for it to be able to take the decisions. And a sub part of what is called machine learning is something that we hear more and more often in the news is called deep learning, which is basically what is pouring, for instance, uh, AlphaGo, you know, this uh, uh, um, uh, DeepMind uh, is this uh, uh, British company that has been developing this algorithm that is able to beat up the uh, world masters of Go, for instance. It's all based on deep learning. Deep learning is a particular part of machine learning. It's still, again, a set of algorithms that mimic how the, uh, the neurons in our brain works. And, and essentially, this is just fed by example. So I've tried really to, to minimize here the effect because the technology can be complex, but it's essentially today only based on what we call supervised machine learning, which means that we need to be able to feed the algorithm examples, realizations of a give to be able to predict and build the, the outcome. And only then the machine can learn and reproduce what they have been taught. Um, so how that works, so for instance, here you have a, uh, uh, the, the most, let's say, advanced uh, usage of, of machine learning is in, uh, is in uh, um, recognition, picture, uh, picture uh, recognition. So here you have an elephant, an elephant uh, picture of an elephant. Essentially, what the machine learning is going to do, uh, or the deep learning, uh, deep learning neural network is going to do, is to identify bits and pieces. It's not trying to recognize the entire elephant itself, what is going to try to recognize different features of the elephant. So for instance, the ears or the trunk uh, uh, um, and or the, or the tail. So essentially what the machine learning is doing is that it's able to say, okay, this is an ear, this is a trunk. So all the together that makes an elephant. So that's rather simple. And, it's an, and, and what we do today is what I call usually software 2.0. So we are using the same recipes that we've been doing for the past 20 years in software engineering and software development, but with a twist. And the twist is, instead of inside the software having rules that are encoded by human, so if, else, then, so if there is two ears that are that big, uh, uh, if there is a trunk that is that big, etc., then it's an elephant. Now what we do is that we replace this, this piece of code that is purely developed by a human by an algorithm that is learning on its own. And instead of just coding yourself, we just show pictures of an elephant or many pictures of different elephants and pictures of things that are not elephants. And we just let the algorithm learn based on these examples, the rules itself. The advantage there is that it gets extremely accurate but also extremely versatile we can use the same methodology with different examples. So first we can train the model on elephants, and then we can train the model of, on coffee cups if we want. Completely different things, but the, essentially the software will be uh, developing a logic based on the example that we feed it. So in fact, forget about the technology, leave it to the uh, software engineer and, and the machine learning engineer, it's all about the data. And that's essentially the message today. If you want to apply this technology for agriculture, it's all about the data, how we're going to collect information and feed those machines with the right information. So data collection is the pain point. It's not technology. And here I will browse very briefly, I'm, I'm mindful of the time, uh, uh, how uh, Internet of Things can help, for instance. So, as I said, technology is not the limit factor. In fact, uh, access uh, to uh, the fresh access threshold to this type of technology, machine learning based technology, gets easier and easier. There's a lot of open source uh, uh, code out there that can be used. Lots of very clever young chaps are able to use it and, and, and leverage it. But the problem is now how we can uh, acquire and identify which is the right data to be able to feed those algorithms. And it's time and cost consuming. Um, so that can start with, uh, for instance, leveraging uh, satellite images data, which is something that we do uh, regularly at this SPSF, which is easy because satellite data are very well understood, very well uh, limited. It's very large uh, data set, but that at least this is very clean information. 
Uh, we can leverage, like you can see, uh, an Internet of Things. So in this case, these are uh, uh, um, weather stations that are put in a field that they can be used to collect information around wind, around uh, precipitations, around the amount of sun, around temperature, about the humidity rate, etc. And they're automatically connecting and put in the internet. So we can dev uh, deploy this type of stations uh, across the fields and just keep collecting the information. In that case, it's still digital from the start, but uh, already the quality may differ. And uh, you need to make sure that the station is well maintained. You need to make sure that uh, the uh, location is well established, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And there are all the factors that can basically prevent us to get good data. And then we have really the dirty part of, of data. So on the top, uh, on the bottom uh, right hand side here, you can see what we call optical character recognition technology, which is essentially a technology that is used to recognize uh, scripts uh, and, and digitalize it directly and use it and, and, and to be to be minded by the algorithms. Um, we can imagine that in, uh, in agriculture, we know that we have uh, many, many logs, uh, uh, farming logs available that have been on books and written, and it's a very, very important nowadays that we start mining those logs to get the historical information that is necessary to develop our algorithms for predictions, uh, or yield predictions, for instance. And the last one is that we see on the top is the handset. Obviously, uh, internet technology is very present. Everyone has uh, mobiles, and there's a lot of apps existing, and uh, app-based data collection is a thing, of crowdsourcing. For me, uh, crowdsourcing data is uh, is a very important uh, topic nowadays. So it's something that develops in agriculture as well. Uh, for instance, uh, providing apps for farmers all across the world to take pictures of a particular plant that has a disease and be able to automatically recognize uh, uh, what is the disease uh, at stake here. Um, this is very important for us to uh, crowdsource and, and gather how much data as possible. But then this is even more problematic to make sure that the quality of the data is good enough, that the label of the data is good enough. If someone takes a picture of a cat and tells us it's a dog, that would be a problem at large scales. So we need to be able to clean and, and, and really curate this information. So this is where actually a domain knowledge to play a very important role. And it's all about data, 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 as I said. So we need to have someone that understands very much the problem to be able to uh, help us identify the right data, but also clean the data, validate the data, label the data. This is the, in this case, this particular picture of this particular disease. So we need people that are in intersection between domain knowledge, agriculture, and uh, data technology. Uh, this is where close collaboration with farmers get very, very important in our field, and in particular also with the extension workers, the extension workers that we can train uh, uh, around uh, around the uh, the arcane of data, let's say, and, and they can help us and support us to really uh, uh, leverage uh, the, the information that's collected at the farmers. So this combination of data knowledge and domain knowledge is very very important. It's something that we're doing at, in the room here or at SBSF, where we combine data experts with agricultural experts and work together to solve those very complex problems. So in if you allow me a couple of minutes more, I will just go very briefly into uh, the prospect of careers because uh, we all are uh, uh, looking towards the future and I really, really interestingly believe that the future of agriculture is in, around digital farming and precision agriculture. There's no deny of it. So the idea is how we could combine the best of both worlds between data science and agriculture. And uh, what we commonly say is that data science is at intersections between uh, statistics and mathematics computer science, but domain knowledge. And this last part is very, very important, as I just mentioned several times. And to be honest, nowadays, the statistics and computer science get things that we can, uh, with the right, uh, uh, let's say, association and, and the right collaboration with the right expert, something that can be leveraged. But the most difficult part remains on the domain knowledge. Um, we probably, you probably heard a lot about data scientists, and essentially not one type of data scientist. There are many, let's say, a range of, of skills in data science, combining from analytics, so be, people are able to uh, analyze data and, and, and discuss with the business or research uh, partners here, down to what we call data engineers, which are more on the software engineering side, that are people that can basically bring pipeline, build pipelines to bring the data into 
to call the algorithms at scale with lots of information. And all those type of people are data scientists. So what you need to build is essentially cross-functional teams. Like uh, I'm a French and a former uh, rugby player, so it's a piece, picture of what we call a scrum in, in rugby. It's essentially people jumping on top of each other to catch the ball. Uh, and the main seems like to be a mess, but actually in this mess, everyone has a very, very important role to play for it to be a success, a success and to win. Uh, and this is essentially what's happening when you want to uh, really uh, uh, leverage uh, data technology is combining all those different strengths together. So the challenge ahead is not about the volume of data. We can do that nowadays, especially with cloud-based uh, computing, but it's really to get the right data. It's to really put your data experts working very closely with your uh, knowledge, uh, domain knowledge experts in agriculture to understand uh, what uh, data, which data and how it can be used. So we need to establish some collaborations between domain experts and data experts. And I think that at the university level, that gets in more and more critical and research level, that agriculturists and, and data experts start working very closely together, that we can move this field to the next level. Um, we can also leverage existing networks, for instance, extension workers in the farms that we can basically train and support for them to be a bit more uh, um, to increase their knowledge around data, that they can really help data collection and uh, of high and relevant quality data. And it also requires uh, uh, to deepen knowledge in data technology at all level. And uh, as part of our graduate undergrad programs, it would be important to have this topic coming in more and more, and more uh, surfacing one and more uh, with mixed education programs. And as such, I'm a adjunct professor at the Novel University called Plakchai University that is currently based in Gogaon, where we exactly doing this. That means that we are uh, taking people with, uh, proposing a master program where we're having people with uh, specific domain knowledge and we help them ramping up into uh, design, machine learning and AI and uh, software engineering that they can really leverage the best of both worlds in their career development. So just for all the, all the students in the call, uh, the future of agriculture is you. So it, you should not be concerned the scale of the technology. As I said several times, this technology is getting easier and easier to access and you will find around the, the right expert to support you there. You shouldn't be scared of math and statistics. This is not where the problem is. You need to embrace this uh, revolution and what you need is to build from your existing strength. And what is very critical here is really the sound knowledge of agriculture. Only with this knowledge, you can identify which data and how to use this technology. Um, and so please partner with the right experts. And with these few words, this is the end of our presentation. We overrun a little bit. Um, here is the details and the contact details of, uh, of uh, Dr. Shravani Bazu and Dr. Mukhtar Bazu, both in the call. Uh, feel free to reach out to us. Thank you very much. I will take a question now. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for a very uh, brilliant and excellent talk, uh, for uh, opening our minds to understand what is artificial intelligence and what are its okay. application in agriculture field. Some basic queries have been raised by uh, some graduates or some few NGOs. Um, one has say, uh, one has asked, sir, how does data science uh, can help a farmer? Like how it will support to agriculture. So uh, as I described in the uh, in, uh, in the example before, so uh, essentially uh, in the case of, of uh, alerting for pests, with the right uh, technology in place, we can even inform ahead a given uh, farmer that a pest is going to be uh, infesting its field with uh, quite a high accuracy. So uh, if the farmer needs to apply some pesticides. It could very extremely costly and actually uh, 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 damaging for the crops and the environment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So with the with the with the right prediction algorithms, we can warn the uh, the farmers ahead that oh, okay. in a few weeks there is a very high risk for this particular on which particular pesticides they can use there. That they use it only when. Oh, yes. 
Sure, sir. Uh, means uh, all these data analysis will help us for uh, formulating a uh, means for uh, modeling. Like means on raw data, we will develop a predict uh, a model, and on the uh, basis of predictions, we will apply that in the field. Right, sir? Exactly. Exactly. So we could. Okay. Yeah. Okay, sir. So uh, can we imagine? Yeah, 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 madam, please. It, it goes from crop insurance, crop financing, getting credit for farmers, supply chains. It could be applied to many different aspects of agriculture. It's not okay. just predicting around disease or outbreaks, but also prediction around the price um, of a particular commodity or prediction around the economic yield and stuff like that. And then based on that, farmers can decide whether the it's interesting to grow a particular crop or not based on the price predictions. And that way we can diversify farming systems as well. So many different aspects of agriculture can be modeled and um, you know we can provide predictions real time so that the right decisions are taken before and not after a crop is in the field. Sure ma'am, okay, nice ma'am. So, uh, ma'am, uh, can uh, any any success story of artificial intelligence used in application in field of agriculture? Can you quote any success story in India? The use of AI in agriculture. I think a lot of work is going around. Um, you know, because the Narendra Modi government he wants to increase farmers' income, double farmers' income, and yes, ma'am, yes. a lot of companies at the moment. They are looking into how um, supply chains can be optimized. So a lot of work is going on in this area, but um, we are yet to hear, um, you know, con about concrete products that are out and uh, that are performing consistently. So a lot of research and development is going on in this area, and there are many companies which are working. And especially if you look at uh, the success stories, I mean, also demand prediction for agricultural output. Uh, for fresh vegetables, fresh fruits, which are perishable, it's very important. And um, if you if you look a lot of uh, platforms which are you know supplying um, fresh commodities from farm to fork, farm to fork model, they use a lot of prediction and they use a lot of modeling to kind of do this kind of delivery from farm to directly to the doorstep of the buyer. And the e-commerce platforms basically but in agriculture these are the success stories we have to look at the the, the main fields where uh, uh machine learning and artificial intelligence has been used with, uh, in the past let's say five years in agriculture are most uh, related to insurance and financing yes so it's it's, it's uh, uh using data to be able to predict yield to uh, basically provide a risk for the insurer uh, so in terms of macro financing, for instance, in India, this is where the uh, main part of the applications have been have been uh, used so far. But if you look abroad, like for instance in the US, with the climate company, uh, for instance, yeah, which is, uh, which is uh, Monsanto acquisition and buyer now acquisition, uh, they give me uh, very uh, satellite images of data to really support planning, a uh, long-term planning of uh, of, um, uh, of crops that open at large scales. Um, so there, there are lots of uh, examples uh, uh, outside India already, and in India, I think the, the, main, the main successes are around currently financing. And, and the climate company has perfected the prediction to a level of, I think, of one square meter. So basically, they can provide insurance based on the performance per square meter of your field. But again, the problem that India faces is highly fragmented land holdings, whereas in the US, if you look, it's highly mechanized fields over several hundreds of hectares and um, growing only a few five major crops across the US. Whereas in India, we grow a range of crops and on very small holdings. So um, the challenges are um, very different. And so, uh, and so the strategy we use in the Indian context has to be modified and adapted compared to what we have seen in the West. Okay, ma means ma'am, uh, for uh, popularizing of AI in agriculture, our Indian government should have uh, should have to frame out some policies, right, ma'am, to promote it. Yes, I think the Indian government um, is already trying to do that, and um, I'm sure we'll see uh, certain steps coming up. But uh, yeah. So uh, maybe. Uh, sure. 
No, of course we can, can uh, dive much more, but uh, with SBSF we try to partner with uh, with governments as well. I think we have a partnership going on with uh, here at the right? Yeah. Uh, so we are we are trying to uh, to uh, that it works closely with the institutions uh, in research, but also uh, in governments to to develop uh, uh, usage of, of AI. Uh, I think DeepMind is also something, uh, Google's DeepMind is something the Indian government uh, uh, has actively investigated. So, uh, and also uh, en enabling small startups to kind of, you know, um, tech based companies around agriculture. This is also a policy initiative that will go a long way. Sure. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am, for a very interactive and informative session. So, I'm thankful to Dr. Shramli and Dr. Sebastian. For a very interesting and beautiful talk. Now, I request to our special guest, Dr. Mukti Satan Basu, sir, who is MD of SBSF Consultancy. I request him to put, uh, to submit his, his, some kind words for our uh, participants. You're most welcome, sir. Dr. Joshi, thank you very much. And uh, for me, the veteran scientist, every meeting is a learning point for me. And uh, during our time, as you know, I mean, the questions like, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, etc., were not even on the dream. And we did work with the uh, climate and uh, particularly the mining of data and their analysis, prediction, and all those things. But now situation is changing. And in Indian agriculture, a lot of complexities are there, as Savani said. So we have to overcome that fragmented agriculture, bringing a huge number of data, correlate them, collate them with the problems and then find a solution. That's probably is going to be the order of the day. And I'm sure particularly these are being used apart from agricultural production, productivity for many other allied aspects and particularly in the entire value chain. Uh, that's becoming smart nowadays and that guiding a kind of better market, including the export uh, orientation, etc. So country is also moving, I'm sure that artificial intelligence is going to be the order of the day <clears throat> and Indian agriculture is going to be smart as your smart cities, smart villages and finally we will have the smart agriculture. Thank you for giving me a chance and uh, I am thankful to the Professor S.K. Rao, Dr. Singh and thank you Mrs. Joshi for uh, giving me an opportunity to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you so much sir, for sparing your valuable time. Uh, now I request our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor S.K. Rao, to submit his golden words in this yeah. learned gathering. You are most welcome, sir. Thank you, Dr. Joshi and uh, Dr. Shavani Basu and Dr. Sebastian Pokard and Dr. M.S. Basu and all the faculty members and the students. I think it is a very good uh, informative presentations with the diversified speakers and having very good uh, background of the multiple subjects that Shavani is having the agriculture, business management, and the impact studies and the data analytics and all these things, artificial intelligence. Similarly, the other speaker is also having the uh, differential academic background and have working on the data analytics and its use in this agriculture applications. And it is a new area for the domain experts like agriculture and using the artificial intelligence the several state governments and in the different countries, they have to use their data properly. In agriculture, data is not a problem. But acquiring the right data, as you rightly said, and putting in the right platform and getting the information out of there and then utilizing the impact studies and the business developmental activities for future, many companies are doing. Multinational companies are already using this type of uh, uh, artificial intelligence and IT applications in their business uh, through the data analytics. I think it, we, we got a lot of information, though we are not, don't have any background of artificial intelligence applications, but we have to use it for future requirement for the students as well as for the state, state governments also. And this will have a help for the crop production planning for the state governments. And artificial intelligence we have applied in case of soybean price prediction in our state, and it is having a 93% of accuracy. And we have, we have given a project for three years and they come up with the uh, solutions having the predictability up to 95% with the predict the prices of the soybean produced in the coming years. And similarly, it can be done for others also in other areas. 
and it is the future of the day, as uh, Dr. Basu rightly said, and we have to work on that. The domain knowledge is have a, have a powerful knowledge for the for the IT experts. Then they can definitely deliver the better things for the farmers as well as for the society, as well as for the planners and the political leaders. Thank you very much for, again, Shavani and uh, and, uh, and uh, even Sebastian and Dr. Basu once again for giving us an opportunity to understand about all these things. Thank you again. Thank you, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Um, so uh, before uh, letting all the, all the participants and speakers and special guests of this program, I request to Dr. Shashi S. Yadav. Madam has joined us. I request to Madam to please uh, give a vote of thanks. Is thankful and grateful to our honorable vice chancellor, Dr. S.K. Rao, sir, for giving us this opportunity under NHGP to organize this invited talk on IoT and AI applications in agriculture. We thank to ICAR, uh, World Bank, and uh, uh, NHGP for assisting and organizing this, this talk. Uh, I express a big thank to our speakers, Dr. Shravani Basu and Dr. Sebastian Fokard, sir, for providing very knowledgeable and informative um, uh, ideas regarding the data handling and processing. Thanks to our, our co-patron, Dr. Mridhra Brilorema, convener, uh, Dr. S.K. Sharma, sir, coordinator, uh, Dr. Ekta Joshi, ma'am, uh, Dr. Sudhir Bajoria, sir, Dr. Akhilesh Sang, sir. Uh, thanks to one and all directly or indirectly involved in this invited talk. Thank you very much. Thanks to NHGC. Thank you. So once again, I'm thankful to one and all. Thank you, uh, Basu sir, Shramni Madam, Dr. Sebastian for sparing your valuable time and sharing your ideas on this platform for Indian agriculture. I'm really thankful all of you once again. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you.